Good morning, I'm Carmen Bombach, Curator of Drawings and Prints. I'm delighted to speak to you today on behalf of my colleagues who worked on the exhibition Raphael to Renoir, Drawings from the Collection of Jean Bona. This is the first ever comprehensive exhibition dedicated to the collection of Mr. Jean Bona. It is on display upstairs in the Drawings and Prints galleries and remains on view until April 26, when it goes to its second venue in the National Gallery of Scotland, Edinburgh. My colleagues in this exhibition are Stane Olsteins, George Goldner, Colta Ives, Perrin Stein, and Natalie Strasser, who is curator of the Jean Bonnet collection. In addition, a number of international specialists also wrote for the scholarly catalog accompanying the exhibition. We are grateful to John O'Neill, editor-in-chief of Museum Publications, Barbara Cavaliere, and Janie Kushner, our editors, Peter Anthony and Sal Destro, Marjorie Shelley, and the Department of Paper Conservation, Linda Silling, Michael Langley, and Emil Misha for the design, David Delgaiso and Ricky Luna for the installation, as well as the exhibitions office and the registrar's office. Mr. Jean Bona owns about 380 old master drawings and 19th century drawings. The museum's exhibition consists of a selection of 120 drawings chosen by the museum's curators. The show aims to portray the overall character of Mr. Bona's very unique collection. The works on display range in date from about 1490 to 1906 and represent a great variety of artistic schools. Mr. Bona is a trustee of the museum and he is a native of Geneva and for a long time ran the family banking firm of Lombard Odier Tarriere Hinge, founded in 1796 as a managing partner. Mr. Jean Bona began collecting drawings about 22 years ago. It is fair to say that his collection ranks among the top most private collections of old master and 19th century drawings in terms of its aesthetic quality and historical importance. No more than a half a dozen other collectors are in his league, as George Goldner has observed in another context. Mr. Bona is also an erudite collector of rare books, his collection of French literature being among the foremost in the world. It is worth remembering here that the aims and presentation of a private art collection are very different from those of a museum collection. For example, in our acquisitions program at the museum, we attempt to build on strengths or fill in gaps in the museum's collection. And the objective is to work towards encyclopedic comprehensiveness through a var great variety of examples. By contrast, and as Mr. Bona has stated in interviews, he collects drawings guided by his personal taste and personal reaction to drawings. To quote Mr. Bona, with drawings, what really seduces me is the fact that they are generally the first idea of the artist, end of quote. As Mr. Bona has expressed, he admires grace and harmony, and it is the reason why the collection has many drawings of landscapes, many female figures, and many works in color. The pastel drawing by Renoir, seen here at upper left, combines all three qualities. In the exhibition upstairs, you will notice as well that the drawings are displayed in Mr. Bona's period frames. As a collector, Mr. Bona began by acquiring Italian Renaissance drawings, and Italian drawings continue to be a main focus of his collecting. Among the earliest drawings on display in the museum's exhibition are two beautiful examples by artists from Venice. Both drawings are done with a brush in liquid media, but in very different techniques. At left, the small sheet by Vittore Carpaccio from 1515 was done quite boldly for its small size with a somewhat thick brush and stippled parallel strokes. At right is a delicately descriptive drawing of a man's head by an artist from the circle of Giovanni Bellini, dates around 1500 and is done with nearly imperceptible brush strokes. Mr. Bona has often sought to acquire more than just one example by a given artist, which presents a great challenge in the case of early Italian drawings as they are hard to come by. On the screen are two drawings by the same Florentine artist, Fra Bartolomeo. At left, the landscape in pen and ink is done on the spot and dates to circa 1500, from around the time before he gave up painting to take up vows as a monk in the Dominican order. 
Fra Bartolomeo is among the earliest artists to have pursued the practice of drawing landscapes from nature. At the right is Fra Bartolomeo's study done in black chalk for the Madonna and Child in the Cambi altarpiece from 1509. In contrast, it is full of smoky effects or sfumato, and its overall approach seems very painterly and influenced by Leonardo da Vinci. The most important masterpiece among Jean Bona's Italian drawings is a study by Raphael, seen at left, a sheet that comes from the fabled collection of the Dukes of Devonshire and Chatsworth, and which was sold at auction in 1987. It is a drawing from Raphael's mature period from 1514-1516 and was preparatory, preparatory for the Roman soldiers at, at the site in the tapestry of the conversion of Saul from the Acts of the Apostles tapestry series designed by Raphael and which are today in the Vatican Museums. You may remember the conversion of Saul from Tom Campbell's Renaissance tapestry show in 2002. Here you see the tapestry reproduced at upper right in a very small photo. I privilege the drawing seen at left, which has been very rarely seen on public exhibition, and which was made by Raphael in a scale that is a small fraction of the final tapestry. The tapestry is about 16 feet tall, while the drawing at left is about one foot tall. The drawing is in a mirror image with respect to the final tapestry because the process of weaving a tapestry reverses the design. To Raphael, the most important concept for these figures was that their poses should seem credible in their movement. They are studied from live models, workshop assistants posed in the artist's studio. Raphael tested out the ideas for the figures in arrested movement by first drawing with a sharp point on the paper before he even used the red chalk. The detail of Raphael's study seen on the screen shows you the preliminary underdrawing done by the artist with the sharp point. See that to the top of the figure. It is clear that Raphael drew boldly with this sharp point on the paper several times making indentations which seemed invisible until he started drawing with the red chalk over the incised lines. This evidence of copious incised underdrawing provides a significant way of distinguishing Raphael's drawings in red chalk from contemporary copies. As Mr. Bona has said in interviews, his favorite Italian drawing is a study for a holy family with shepherds and angels by Parmigianino seen at left. It is a quick study by the young artist dating to 1524 while he was about to leave the city of Parma for Rome. The study by Parmigianino is full of vibrant, curvy outlines and luminous washes, although his strokes of the shorthand notation are not yet very certain. Here, the foreshortened hand of the Christ child at center needed correction with lead white, which is now oxidized to a gray, to a gray stain. Mr. Bona owns five Parmigianinos and many other drawings by artists from Parma and the region of Emilia. Not all of his Emilian drawings are by artists of big names, but they are certainly very accomplished. An example is a vigorous drawing in red chalk by Michelangelo Anselmi, seen here at right, an allegorical decoration with the arms of Hadrian, Pope Hadrian VI, which dates from 1524, exactly the same time as Parmigianino's holy family on the left. Rarely published, the drawing at left by the young Federico Parocci had been little studied before the museum's exhibition. And in the course of research, it became clear that it was one of the artist's earliest pastel drawings, datable between 1550 and 1560, as I've proposed of perfectly calibrated features, the woman's serene face may remind the viewer at once of the Madonnas by Piero della Francesca and Raphael, artists who were the heroes in the town of Urbino, which was also the birthplace of Parocci. At right is a drawing of vibrant color, none in gouache, in the 1580s by Jacopo Ligozzi, an artist from Verona, who on his arrival in Florence became one of the court painters of Grand Duke Francesco Primo de' Medici. 
It is a portrait of the Sultan Selim II with a dragon, but which is based on a book illustration of the period found in Nicolas de Nicolet, Les Quatre Premiers Livres de Navigation et Peregrination, which was published in Italian editions in 1577 and 1580. The wild boar piglet is likely to be one of the all-time favorites in the exhibition. It was produced by Hans Hoffmann, signed with its monogram and dated 1578, and is closely inspired by Albrecht Dürer's famous animal studies, but done 50 years after that great master's death. Hoffmann's piglet is painted in color with an extremely fine brush and gouache on vellum. Among other points, it superbly illustrates the ability of late 16th century artists to depict nature with a scientific verisimilitude. In the exhibition, Hoffmann's wild boar piglet is part of a grouping of nature drawings done in color by Jacopo Ligozzi and Jacques Lemoine de Morgue. Drawn around 1600, the amorous scene of the rest of Venus and Mars by Henry Coltius was intended as an autonomous finished work. The holdings of northern drawings in the Jambona collection are very beautiful, although not numerous compared to the holdings of French and Italian drawings. The sheet by Colsius is a relatively new discovery. I do not do justice to the display of Italian Baroque artists in the exhibition and merely mention at left Guercino's study of a woman in three quarter view from 1635-1640. This is a masterpiece of quick penmanship in which the artist does not seem to have lifted the pen from the paper until he was practically finished drawing, so continuous are his loopy outlines throughout the forms. At right, you see probably one of the most beautiful drawings ever done by Jacopo Vignali, the head of a girl with a coral necklace from around 1625. Vignali was otherwise a painter of modest talent. The exhibition includes three landscape drawings by Claude Lorrain, the great French landscape painter of the 17th century who spent almost his entire career in Italy. This mature, sublime study done in 1663 depicts a view of Mount Soracte. The Mount Soracte mentioned by Horace in a famous ode is about 25 miles north of Rome. Claude's drawing suggests the permanence and majestic scale of nature only muted by the flying birds at upper right. The drawing is in very good condition, so much so that one can sense fully the atmospheric light bathing the abstract forms of the landscape. The white color of the paper provides a major hue in the chromatic scale. One can also almost sense the speed of Claude's black chalk in the underdrawing as it structured the shadowy middle ground with trees and farm buildings. The painterly technique of drawing with three colors of chalk, red, black, and white, had been explored by late Renaissance artists, but French artists took this technique of three chalks, trois crayons, to new heights in the late 17th and 18th centuries. At left, the small exquisite study by Antoine Watteau from 1718 or 1719 explores the poses for the heads of the women seen from three different points of view. At right, the much larger study in the trois crayons technique from around 1740 by Francois Boucher portrays a woman seen from the back. In Boucher's drawing, the changes of outlines along the contours of the shoulder at left, or pentimenti, immediately identify the exploratory nature of this otherwise relatively finished study intended to be used for a figure in the foreground of a tapestry design and also reprised in another painting, but in, in another painting by the artist. From 1771 onward, Jean-Simeon Chardin devoted himself almost exclusively to pastel portraits of the kind that is illustrated here at left, and these brought him great fame. Dating from about 40 years earlier, however, the drawing of curiosity by Chardin seen here at right is done in black, red, and white chalk and was among the last drawings on paper done by the artist. 
After 1730, Chardin increasingly painted directly from nature or from the post life model before him, skipping the step of preliminary sketches on paper. Therefore, sketches by Chardin of the type seen here at right are exceedingly rare. I'm told that the total number of such sketches by Chardin is about 10. A personal favorite is the large drawing by Carle van Loo of Perseus rescuing Andromeda dating to 1762. The artist Carle van Loo is not a household name today, but was considered by at least one contemporary to have been among the greatest draftsmen of his century. The liveliness of this boldly worked up drawing does not come across in photographs. It is best studied in the original in the exhibition. No amount of my describing can convey to you properly the physicality and the textures of this drawing, particularly in the copious use of white gouache. The artist applied the whites at times in clumps, at other times in long brush strokes, and even in transparent veils. Done with two colors of red chalk, the head of a young girl by Jean-Baptiste Creuse from around 1770 seems to have been produced as an independent work, perhaps for one of the collectors who began avidly seeking Creuse's work during his lifetime. This is a ravishing drawing among a number by Creuse in the Bonner collection. Dating around 1796-1797, the sheet from the Madrid album by Francisco de Goya is displayed double-sided in the exhibition. It provides a vivid premonition of what would later evolve as a suite of 80 etchings that Goya published as Los Caprichos. At left, the figure of the composer at the piano is overcome by grotesque singers. Cantan para el que lo hizo. They sing for the one who composed it. At right, you see the other side of Goya's sheet. A sleeping woman, or perhaps she is dead, puts her finger in the chamber pot. Sueña de un tesoro, she dreams of a treasure. The 19th century drawings are perhaps the strongest part of the Jambona collection, and some of the greatest artists are also represented by several examples. Of the nine drawings by Theodor Jericho owned by Mr. Bona, six are in the exhibition. Here illustrated are Jericho's preliminary study for the Italian family at right, done in graphite and chalk, and the bold final composition of the Italian family done with watercolor and gouache over Conte Crayon seen at left. The project dates to 1816, 1817, during Jericho's stay in Rome. The large sheet in watercolor, Arabs in Morocco, produced by Eugène Delacroix at the end of his journey in Morocco in 1832, is to my eye simply stunning for its use of the paper. What is not drawn seems as significant as what is drawn on the paper. These two drawings, although done almost contemporaneously, markedly contrast in their approaches to the model of nature. At left, the portrait of 1857 by Dega, representing his Italian cousin, Adelchi Morbilli in Naples, is exquisitely restrained in its deployment of detail, although it is drawn from life, and delicately so, in graphite, with a control worthy of anger. In contrast, at right, the landscape scene from the late 1850s by Jean-Francois Millet is richly drawn in saturated black chalk with brown-gray wash and depicts a hut and well at Millet's birthplace in Grouchy, Normandy. Yet for all the profusion of naturalistic detail, its sense of closely observed time and place, Millet's beautiful drawing appears to have been a recreation in the artist's studio following his summer in Grouchy rather than done directly from nature. It is said that Edouard Manet began to take up pastel in the late 1870s because he was ill and found the technique less tiring. Dating between 1878 and 1882, Manet's pastel on canvas portrays Madame Lubin, 
who was a family friend and who was frail with illness. She was in fact bedridden. She's seen here in a close-up view while she lay in her white canopied bed. The drawing is an extraordinary exercise of the pastel medium, not the least of it because of how Manet exploited the fine weave of the canvas support to suggest texture and to provide a gray buff ground tone for much of the composition. The work by the mature Dega is also magnificently represented in the Bona collection. Illustrated at left is an arresting sheet of preparatory studies in pastel, black and white chalk on salmon pink paper. The studies were intended for two different dancers in the painting of the dance lesson now in Washington from around 1879. At right is a much later study also of dan dancers dating between 1895 and 1905, so almost 20 years later, and which is drawn in charcoal on tracing paper. Dega's drawing at right is part of a large series of such studies. In the compositional arrangement of the figures, here offers a variation on a very famous ancient prototype, the Roman marble sculptures of the Three Graces. Believing black to be the most important color in any artist's palette, Odilon Redon devoted most of his career to working in monochromatic media, but by the 1890s, Redon began discovering the beauty of color as he worked in pastels and oil paints. Redon is well represented in the Jean Bonnat collection, and here illustrated is his pastel of La Barque, the sailing boat with two passengers from circa 1900. In the Bonner show, Redon's La Barque is exhibited near one of his monochromatic drawings from 1883, portraying spring. And the comparison underscores the artistic transformation of Redon in the 1890s. An arresting masterpiece, Redon's La Barque, is really an explosion of color, worked with a rich variety of application of the pastel pigments. It is right to thank Mr. John Bona for having assembled such a beautiful and meaningful collection and sharing it with the public. And the exhibition is made possible through the generosity and support of the Gale and Parker Gil Gilbert Fund. Thank you.